Hi, welcome. I'm Mathilde, and I'm an admissions counselor here at the American University of Affairs. Um, I'm here to introduce this session on environmental studies, um, a major that we offer here at AUP. So I'm going to leave uh, you with our two students and our professor to introduce uh, this major and talk more about what they are doing. So enjoy. I will be back at the end. Um, to give you some more info about our virtual week and to give us um, to give you us e our email address. All right, enjoy the session. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I think it said everything that had to be said. This is a, a session on the environmental studies major at the American University of Paris, part of a series for prospect, prospect, prospective, and admitted students at the American University of Paris. I'm Claudio Piani. I joined AUP in the 2012 as, uh, as an associate professor. I'm a climatologist by trade, and I've been at AUP since. I am also the dean for student learning, which means that I'm responsible for making sure students learn what their faculty are teaching. Um, Molly and Clark, would you kindly introduce yourselves for our viewers? Um, I can go first. So my name is Malia. Um, I'm from France and from Sweden, and I grew up in both countries. Uh, so I'm pursuing a major in environmental studies and a minor in sociocultural anthropology. And I'm also involved on campus in different sustainable projects. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, I have been at AUP since the fall of 2018. Um, I'm from America in a small town in Northern Idaho. I made my way over here to Paris uh, to study um, a double major in environmental studies and international politics with a minor in economics. All right, well, thank you very much for that. So, so um, why, are we, why are we here to talk about environmental studies? Uh, well, one of the reasons is that this major in environmental studies, which I think was developed in 2014, 2015, has seen uh, uh, quite a significant uptick in number of students. Uh, it's, it's very successful, more so than other majors we've had in environmental sciences or focused on the environment. And I think that there's a few reasons for that. And I would say one of the most important reasons for that is that it really embraces the idea of, of, of the liberal arts. Environmental studies is a major that allows students to focus on, on, on you know, the, the biggest concerns or the biggest challenges that face young people today and it's environmental challenges. And, and you know, I mean, we can, we can rattle off the first things that come to mind, but at least what comes to my mind is of course, you know, global warming, uh, climate change, climate change impacts. I mean, my research is, uh, focuses on, on, uh, on climate change impacts. So, changes in river discharge, uh, glacier melt, but also um, agricultural yield. There's, there's a lot of work done on what the impacts of climate change will be on agricultural yield. And certain places are much more vulnerable than others. And um, those places that are, that, that, are, that are looking to have a much larger uh, climatological impact also happen to be those places where uh, societies are most vulnerable. Um, and, and what comes to mind to me as a climatologist is uh, sub-Saharan Africa is a place where the climate has large multi-decadal variability and is also a place where there is uh, subsistence agriculture and it's rain fed. So small changes in precipitation patterns can create large uncertainties in, in food availability. So those are the places that are most vulnerable. And the fact is that people today, people your age are faced with the task of solving these problems. And that's, that's daunting. But these problems can only be solved if people, if people your age and your generation have a sort of, I hate to use the term because everyone uses it, but a holistic approach. Uh, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, but that's, that's, that, that's the crux, isn't it? I mean, uh, Clark, you're, you, if I understand correctly, you're double majoring in, in politics as well. So you, you understand because of, of, of the, of the, of the subjects that you're focusing in, you understand that the solution to climate change is not in the hand of scientists alone. Um, I, I was in this, I was in this, this job in, in the 90s. And in the 90s, we were already coming out with you know, complicated reports telling people what to do, what not to do. And 
it all went in one ear and out the other. And the solution to this problem can only come about when people look at it from, ver from, the, from the perspective of various fields. So you have to look at the political field, the, the, the scientific field, the field of international relations, and crucially, you need to look at it from the point of view of, of who are the vulnerable stakeholders and what kind of discourse, what kind of relation, what kind of, of um, what pros and cons you're gonna place on the table to try to solve this problem. Now I've gone off and started talking <laughs> about climate change, which I knew was gonna happen because I, I go off that way. But, but for example, um, guys, interrupt me if I'm, if I'm turning this into a soliloquy. But for example, we saw, like, what did we see? The, the biggest crisis of our times, like right now, we can't seem to see anything else but COVID. That's, that's been the shock, right? I mean, you remember, you know, if you try hard, you can remember November. Last November, the big shock were wildfires in Australia. Do you have any recollection of that? Very vaguely, because whatever the crisis was in Australia was nothing even close to this, yeah? And this kind of, of, of big shock that has, hit, that has hit the world, this huge crisis, has, has shown a light on, on what are the effects of changing uh, in cities. It's focused, it's also helped us focus on what are the effects on environment. I gave a very brief presentation for AUP some four or five months ago on what the consequences were of our reduced mobility because of COVID. Um, and I'll show some pictures later on. But if you guys remember what it was like in April, the big, big crises were in, in, in big cities. There was, there was uh, Milan in Europe and New York in the States, France, not quite as, as, as rough as Milan. And, um, and those were the big places where, where, where you had a, a, a disastrous uh, casualty level. And, and we talked about what, and I'll, and I'll show a few pictures later on about what the, what, the, um, uh, what the CO2 output, how it dropped in those cities and what the environmental, the sort of benign uh, environmental effects were. Um, but I'm getting carried away. Let's get back to environmental studies. So, so the great thing about environmental studies is that you start with a series of courses that give you a grounding. So for example, you do environmental studies, uh, the environmental sciences, the class, then you take classes in ethics, you take classes in microeconomics or macroeconomics, and you take classes in political, in political science. Clark, what, what courses did you take in political science? Did you take uh, Waters of the Globe or? or uh, yeah, I've, yeah, I've taken quite a few of them at this point. Actually, when I got to AUP, I uh, was only gonna be a minor in environmental policy but my first semester I took the course on environmental science. Um, and I think just, I had a really sort of engaging professor who really got me excited about the topic, but it was also the fall of 2018. And if you all remember, that was the same, uh, the month of October was when the 2018 IPCC 1.5 report came out. Right. And I think, I think the release of that report with the specific professor that I had and sort of just the atmosphere of sort of engagement of students in issues of the environment and the sense of urgency that, that I was surrounded in made me uh, decide to, to bump my minor up to a major. Um, but I was always gonna do a politics major. So there's certain, there's certain classes that um, have specific, specifically to do with politics. Right now, uh, Malia and I are taking international politics of the environment. We're taking um, environmental ethics. Uh, last semester, I took Waters of the Globe, which was a really interesting one. There's um, political geography. Um, and uh, I think next semester, they're doing one specifically on the politics of climate change. So there's quite a lot of um, sort of interdis interdisciplinary courses that you can take to, to include politics and the environment, which is why the, the two majors work quite well together. And so if you're talking about politics, the, the big turning point for climate change occurred in 2015 with the, with the Paris Accord. Obviously, you know that you're, you were both involved, not in 2015 Accord, but you've been involved after that in various activities that AUP has had in that regard. And that turning point, that ability to actually start to solve the problem did not come about as a scientific breakthrough at all. We've been refining the sort of 
the, 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 the level at which we know how climate works, but we haven't had great breakthroughs. What happened in 2015 was a change in the approach to international agreements regarding climate change. And in fact, one of the reasons why the, the Kyoto Protocol, if you remember millions of years ago, the Kyoto Protocol came up with a, a way to face the climate, the climate crises and allotted uh, tariffs or changes or, or tasks to each country. Let's put it in the most, in the easiest way possible. It allotted tasks and slowly these tasks fell by the wayside and countries felt they did not want to stick to their, to their agreements and it sort of fell apart in the end. What changed radically from there to the Paris Agreement in 2015 is that countries were asked to come up with their own contribution. And that is what was, that's what a game changer was. Um, right, Malia. So, what's what's your what's your take on uh, on environmental studies? What's your uh, your co? What's your angle? Well, I guess I have a little bit of a different angle because I came at AUP not knowing like at all what I wanted to do. I was really really lost, and I came at AUP That's because right. I wanted to be able to try different things and find my own path. And I think that for me, a big turning point was the climate conference that AUP organized a few years ago when we were able to like sit down with students who had, who were taking different environmental classes but from like a range of different disciplines and kind of like talk about the solutions we wanted for our future. And when I left that conference at AUP, I was like, okay, environmental studies, that's my major from now on. Like I know exactly, I want to continue on that path. I love that conference. And like, those are the kind of issues I want to work with later in life. Could you tell us what that conference is all about? Because I think it's just us three here who know what that is. Well, we had different sections with uh, different issues. So we had a section on agriculture, a section on plastic pollution, I think a section on climate change. And so, and then we were a bunch of classes, all the science classes, also a bunch of environmental politics classes, basically any class that had to do with environmental issues, whether it's anthropology, economics, or politics, or science, we were all mixed together in different groups. And what we did is that we sat at different tables and we had, we had done reading and research prior to those meetings. And we basically just discussed what kind of solutions, what were the issues, how do we want to solve them? What kind of policies would work? And then we presented them to each other. And at the same time, we also had a few guest lecturers that came in and talked about their work and what they were doing and what solutions they had. And basically at the end, that's when a bunch of us AP students, we all joined together and that's how we gave birth to the environmental and service committee that's still running today that's about making our campus more sustainable. I'm part of it as well. I've been part of it since, I guess, so, that was the first. That was the first uh, climate conference um, two years ago or one year ago, it was last year. Um, and now it's a, it's, a, it's a regular event. It happens every two years. The next event is being organized solely by students and will be uh, entirely online for obvious reasons. So it's not going away, it wasn't stopped by COVID. But it was, an, it was a turning point for the American University of Paris and it was a turning point for environmental studies because at that conference, although it was strictly climate change, so it wasn't a broad take on environmental challenges, but at that conference, we had people come in, you know, people from, from sustainable projects. There was a, a sustainable school project in Finland. There was a Swedish bank manager and they were talking in, in broad economic terms. They were talking what kind, they talked about what's called climate smart economy, which is the, 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 the practice of considering all externalities. And, and, and these are words that I learned at the conference. And, and what I mean by that is when you are, when you are fueling the economy, there is a part of the cost that's never taken into consideration because when you emit CO2 into the atmosphere, that's never something that you cost. It has an enormous cost to the entire world population, but the, that component of the economy doesn't pay for it. So that's referred to as, a, as, a, as an externality. And the climate smart economy has to take all those things into account. And when we do take those things into account, we can then start to put together a process of, of advancement, of growth, that takes that, uh, that problem into account. And so that's when you start to see 
the possibility of a solution. Now, um, I, I wanted to, since since both of you are taking ethics, are you both taking ethics this year, environmental ethics? Yeah. So here's can one. I, Go sorry, on. can I speak to the, if we, before we move on, can I speak to the conference that we had at AUP as Oh, well? please do, please do, please do. Yeah, um, so I guess just to start with like, bef like the, the events leading up to the conference, uh, it was sort of nine different professors from all different fields uh, and, and they were some of them classes specifically to do with the environment, but some that you wouldn't think necessarily would. So I think the challenge for the professors was, for example, I took the course political philosophy, which wouldn't necessarily think of as an environmental issue, but it was the challenge that for the professors to include the environment into their curriculum. And as a student, uh, you can do that as well. If it's a class that might be like political philosophy, you can choose to write your term paper on the environment and continually integrate it into other disciplines. Um, but also that was the conference that sort of led to the Oslo project um, because it was from a connection that we met at that, um, at that conference, there was um, a guest speaker and an, an alum from AUP who came um, and she is now working at the Nobel Peace Center and she sort of encouraged students to keep working on projects after the conference. And a, a few of us did and we contacted her and uh, asked if there was anything that we could help her with. Um, and basically it turned into that summer research project um, with four students. And at the end of the summer, we were able to go to the first annual uh, Oslo Peace Packs um, in Norway for the, for the Nobel Peace Center. Um, and that was a conference solely based on climate solutions as well, but it was, it was sort of very high level. You had um, the ex-president of Iceland that was there. You had the um, ex-secretary um, of the UNFCCC. Uh, you had the minister of the environment for Norway. And so it was, as a student, a really interesting opportunity to go and, and participate in something that sort of my research contributed to and see these high level negotiations going on. Yeah, and I mean, go on, go on. I'm sorry, going off what Clark said, that same connection later enabled both you and me to go to the COP25, which was also like, I think like one of the most amazing experiences in my life. And I was able to interact with NGOs and organizations, but also sit down in like big negotiations and see how the Paris Agreement was being talked about and negotiated like on I guess an international scale which I never thought I'd ever be able to experience so that was also like amazing and that was all through all because of the uh, climate conference. Can I, can I point out that the COP25 is the same thing as the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement occurred yeah. at, a, at a previous COP. It's yeah. COP is a conference of the parties and it's a conference of the parties to the uh, NF CC, which is uh, the United Nation Framework on Climate Change. So it's all under the aegis of the UN. Um, and so I just like to point out for whoever is watching this is that you too participated to the most important climate conference on the globe. There's mm -hmm. nothing else above that one. And that's where you went. And you didn't go there to stare at the pretty pictures. You went there to present, am I right? You presented the results from the, the climate conference or you presented at the Oslo and then you went down to, uh, to COP, exactly. Yeah, and right. um, we also, we, we flew down to Madrid the week of finals <laughs> too. We, we submitted all our papers early and got our finals done early and flew down to Madrid and ended the semester that way, so. All um, in good fun, all yeah, in good all fun. fun. Yeah. And then actually the next week after that, the two of us went to the, <laughs> sustainable development practicum in India. So we can talk about that later, but um, there's just, it just goes to show how many incredible opportunities that you have uh, as an AUP student that you would definitely not get any at any other university. And especially right now for the environmental studies major, there's a lot of opportunities if you sort of take the initiative to sort of work with your students I would like work with your fellow students. And if you have the initiative to start a project together, you, you can end up, you know, going to Oslo or Madrid or India. So lots of opportunities. We love throwing things in the hands of students. When you guys take the lead, you guys are, the next conference is done by, by students. That's, we, we could not ask for more. 
And, and one point I wanted to come back to when you talked about environmental ethics, and I, I, I took the class because one of the things I did when I, when I, when I set up the, the major is I started taking the classes of the other, of the faculty who were, who were building the core with. And there's one thing I learned in environmental ethics and, I've, and it's now a mantra that I have, is if you ask yourself, what's your greatest ethical obligation as, uh, as, a, as a responsible citizen, as an empowered leader of tomorrow, and your biggest moral obligation is to self-educate, is you need to know, you need to be aware, not just, not trivially of facts, but you need to be, you need to have a methodology, you need to be able to distinguish truth from, uh, from idiocy, really. Yeah, that's, 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 that's a lot of the dichotomy that we see out there. On one side, there's the truth. On the other side, there's just, there's just, you know, just moronic ideas. And, and so, and, and, and the ability to distinguish and, and to build tools to be able to distinguish is something that empowered citizens, uh, which is what you are, 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 are you are, are and you're, you're improving and you're, and you're becoming what you intend to be. That's what you're trying. That's what you're trying to build. Um, I'm going to show some, some pretty pictures. Do you guys mind? No. All right. No. All right. Let's see if I can get this to work. Whoops. Okay. Guys, tell me if you see that. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. these are one of the things that when we talked about the COVID crisis and we were, we were asking ourselves in the early days why certain places were, were being hit so hard and what were the effects of not using, you know, when we talk about climate, um, one of the things, you know, I, I really don't like saying one of the, you know, good things that came out of COVID. It, it horrifies me to say something like that but we were able to see what the effects of not using cars for a while are. This is, most of you recognize Italy, the big blotch on one side is the amount of um, carbon monoxide, the column of carbon monoxide over the Po Valley uh, in a regular month, that was January. So that was three months before uh, the coronavirus hit and exactly what happened to that whole area um, after, th after one month of, people being in lockdown, not using cars. And this, is, this signals the immediate effect, the immediate short-term potential of people reducing uh, their, their transportation needs and, and the, the drop in, 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 in CO2. So this is a real effect. So when I talk about you know, what your biggest moral imperative is, is educate yourself. People were also talking about things of this sort, like on, on, on the upper left corner, you see the canals of Venice. And the canals of Venice are transparent and people were, you know, crying to the skies, look at how clean the water has become because of the lack of motorboats. But in fact, that's just the effect of not stirring up the bottom. You're, you're seeing nothing else there. So there's nothing real there. And the bottom two pictures are also, uh, you know, are, are, are an eye opener because on one side, that's on the bottom, you have Indonesia, uh, an invasion of macaques. And the reason those macaques are invading cities is because tourists used to be a huge source of food for them. And now they're invading the cities because that source of food is gone with the restriction of travel. Um, the other picture is deer invading a city in Japan also because a large source of food for them were the tourists that fed them. And now those tourists are gone and they're invading. And so one of the things that, that this shows is that we have this idea of a pristine environment, which, is, which means untouched by humans. And this is sort of a starry-eyed idea, something that we try to, you know, and someone who's educated, someone who comes out of a, a truly informative environmental studies major should know how to distinguish what's real from what's not real. And so the drop in CO2 emissions is something real. The, 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 the clearing up of, of, of water in certain places is, is not an interesting phenomena. The idea of pristine environments that, that are tantamount to human free environments is a romantic idea. You know, there are lots of ecosystems in which animals 
are really dependent of the human interaction. And these are two, these are two examples. Um, and, and if you don't mind, guys, I'm going to also uh, briefly introduce the other faculty that, um, that so it's not just me, because I mean, let's face it, the other faculty are better, aren't they? I mean, you've, you've taken their classes. So let's, you know, you're supposed to shake your head. I was hoping you would say, no, no, <laughs> you're good too. But that didn't happen. It's too late now. So let's, this is Elena. This is Elena, not in her prime environment where she's counting beans. And, and, uh, and um, this is Elena Berg. So you've both had, had the Professor Berg. And uh, that lab, I look at it, I still have post-traumatic stress disorder because a lot of people end up spending eight hours in a row in that lab. And that's also something that removes this romantic idea of lab work where you sit around and every day there's Eureka, we've had a breakthrough, you know? And, and that, that's really not how it works. And there's no radioactive spiders either. Um, there's just a lot of, you know, there's a lot of bonding, but bonding that occurs over six to eight hours working in the lab. If anyone wandered, if, was wondering, would I be able to do lab work if I go to AUP? Oh yeah. Oh, Elena just loves to draw students in and have them in the lab. In another incarnation, this is Elena that is also, get this, a water sommelier. She's an expert on different kinds of water. And one of the things that she loves doing with students is showing them how their idea of what they like and what they don't like is based a lot more on branding than actually flavors of water. This is an experiment that, that we've been doing in the lab many, many times. And we ask students to taste waters and tell us, well, which water do you prefer? And then we come back five minutes later with... Um, instead of with, with, uh, with uh, covered bottles. So you don't know what bottle you're tasting. And apparently, if you don't know that you're tasting Evian, it's not that great. And these are, these are <laughs> moments of, of discovery for students. Um, here we go. This is Manuel, our oceanography professor. Oceanography was a course that I started teaching at AUP, but in his words, he's a lot better. Um, uh, of course, he sent me this picture, and my point is that he's wearing a life jacket on land, so he can't be that much better. Uh, but in fact, in his other incarnation, this is Manuel underwater. Now, unlike me, my claim to oceanography is having taken a few measurements from on top of a boat and feeling very, very sick, and hence for becoming an ocean modeler. I, I, I model oceans on a computer. Manuel has more than 2,000 missions under his belt. And since each one of them take a few hours, I've made a calculation. Manuel has spent more time underwater than your average household goldfish. That's the kind of person who you have teaching oceanography at AUP. This is our latest hire. She's an associate professor, um, Jelena Pantel. She deals in this wonderful little aquatic life forms and the picture is uh, is on your left that's i hope i pronounced this correctly it's a it's a daphnia i think and although it's small it's very very pretty you know these these creatures are extremely important um when talking about the health of an ecosystem because they are at the very very bottom um in fact they're just one tier above bottom they are not um they're not, uh, what's the term? Uh, they're not, uh, they don't carry out, uh, they don't have chlorophyll. They don't, they're not photosynthetic. So they don't make their own energy from the sun. They live off photosynthetic um, uh, life forms. But, but normally we, we tend to think about the, the big players in an ecosystem as, as, as big furry creatures, you know, and they're soft and acute and we like them. Um, but if, if all the large mammals disappeared from the earth tomorrow, the earth would actually be absolutely fine. It would, it would recreate an ecosystem within a few, a few uh, maybe a hundred thousand years without a problem. But if the microscopic um, uh, life forms disappeared, it would be a much more difficult comeback. So, oh, and this is the last picture I threw in there. So presenting from right to left, on the far right is my friend and Elena Berg's husband, uh, Jeff. That's me, and uh, I was forced to dye my beard, my beard blue for that run. That's a mud run. Next to me is the director of the English program at AUP. Um, I managed to convince her to come take that run with us. 
She will never come with me again. And then there's another AUP student, Bree, who actually is both a communications and an environmental studies uh, student. So come to AUP, you might get involved in things that are extremely diverting and interesting, like Malia and Clark. You might end up covered in mud up to your hair, like our friend Bria, and I can't guarantee which one it will be. Now, excuse me, I will come back. I will try and come back, uh, stop sharing. There you go. Are we back guys? I mm -hmm. hope so. All right, so let's continue. Let's continue our little chat. Um, so we were talking, we were talking about, about, uh, about you know, the, the ethical imperative, the drive, um, let's talk about what happens when you get out of AUP. All right. So why don't you guys have a think of what, where you think you're going to be when you get out of here. And let me just tell people while you're having that thought, I want to tell you what happened to my, my, when I just got to AUP, my very, very first student graduated in environmental studies. Her name is Anya Verkamp. And you can Google her. And she, you know, she was very first student and she was the sole first graduate for that year. And every once in a while, I check in with her to find out where she ended up because it always surprised me. She's a graduate of both environmental studies and communications. And the first gig she had, well, the first gig she had was during her internship. She went and did an internship in Peru where she was setting up uh, wind turbines for, uh, for locations that were off the grid. Um, but I think she saw that more as just a side gig, a temporary side gig. Her first paid job where they gave her money was working for a forestry company in, I think it was Indonesia, and she was in charge of communications. So her first job was as a communications. And then she moved to Brussels where she actually worked in a government agency doing communications as well. And once in a while, I contact her on WhatsApp and say, tell me what's happening. The last text I had was she wanted to start, uh, she wanted to start a PhD program in Barcelona. But in the meantime, she was sitting in front of a fertilized factory blocking the entrance. So that's where, that's where my students end up. And, and it, it's such a nice experience for me to find out where they are, what they're doing, and how their life evolves in a chaotic and, and, and you know, random way. You never know where they go. You know? but, but, but the one thing that I like about her story and other people like her is that it's not one track. You see an approach to problems and an approach to, 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 to our activities, which is multifaceted. Malia, you wanna, you wanna start tell us where you wanna go or Clark or? Can I well, say something real quick right, yeah. just about the professors before we move on as well. Um, I haven't been lucky enough to have a class with Jelena yet, maybe next semester, hopefully, but uh, Elena Berg with the Beatles in the lab was the professor who went with us to Oslo. And I'm currently working with her on a composting project for the school um, and Manuel, I've one, one semester, uh, well, you get to at ADP, you can audit a co course every semester. And I've actually audited two of his because they're just so fascinating. I audited the one on the oceans and the class sizes are really small and there's a lot of opportunities to get to know your professors and they really like to get to know you. And so I just wanted to sort of say that about each of them, um, but I'll let you go ahead, Malia. No, I mean, I think what you said about the professors is really beautiful and I love it. Having been in the French system where, where there's this kind of hierarchy where your professor's here and you're like down here, I was so happy to go to AUP and like kind of get to see my professors as my mentors and people that inspire me rather than just people who are lecturing me. And it's really amazing. I had Manuel as well. And later like this semester before lockdown happened I was alone eating in the Amex and he joined me and then we just like had lunch together and talked about environment and talked about like the what I wanted to do later in life and it was just amazing to be able to like sit down with your professors and talk and they really all feel like mentors that are here to like help you and any project you have just talk to your professor they can make it happen and help you and I love that about AUP. About my future, I'm actually applying for uh, grad schools right now, and I'm hoping to get in a master program called Environmental Studies and Sustainable Science in Lund, Sweden. So basically just continuing on the same path. Have you, you you're, you're Swedish, right? <laughs> okay. So you yeah. know what winters are like in Sweden. <laughs> yeah, I'm in Sweden right now, it's very dark. 
it gets dark at like three. <laughs> All right, Clark, well, let's hear it. Yeah, so it's sort of similar. I think I'm just going to head right on to grad school, especially right now with the, with the virus. It sort of seems like the sensible thing to do. Um, I'm mostly looking at schools in London. There is a program called Environment and Development, which I'm uh, mostly interested in right now. And I think down the line, um, potentially studying environmental law um, and sort of being an advocate that way. All right. Is it international law? Of course, it's international law. I mean, uh, well, perhaps, but I think environmental specifically. Um, so that way we can stop all of the sort of, well, there's a lot of things you can do with it, but yeah. Stop all the bad so where, things. So, so, so where, where do you, so let's, let's, I'm going to start picking on you right now because you said environmental law and I'm going to just pick on you. And I want to know where you stand. Are you pro nuclear or anti nuclear? I, I'm very skeptical of nuclear energy. All right. I, so you're a not, wind, you're a wind farm and solar kind of guy. Well, I don't know about that either. I think, I think uh, anyone watching this, if you, you're clearly interested in the, in the environment, you should go watch Planet of the Humans. Just came out a documentary on wind and solar, and it might not be exactly as sustainable as you think it is. Yeah. Right. Okay. But yeah, the the you know like what? Sorry, I I. I I want to ask you a couple of questions too, Malia, but, but, you know, when I, my, my main, I get asked that all the time. And I'm personally, I, I, I put a lot of hope into nuclear, uh, a different kind of nuclear. Uh, you know, the fourth generation reactors are, are, are small. They're intrinsically safe. They're, they're not, you know, they're not associated with the, with the disasters uh, like the Fukushima or, or Chernobyl. But, uh, but I think that what, what people, when I say, you know, you know, your biggest, your biggest ethical imperative is to inform yourself. And, and if you just think that Germany is 30% uh, wind and solar and France is 80% nuclear, then between the two, we've always had the potential to go off fossil fuels. We, we've had it now. We had it 20 years ago. So the question as to why we don't is not scientific. It's political, it's legal. It has to do with establishing like, is there a pathway to establish liability for climate change? And if only there is, then that might be the path where you create a tremendous drive for, for climate smart economy. Because once you're liable, once you manage to attribute a percentage of liability for climate change, um, you create an enormous drive for climate smart economy. And that might be a pathway. And that's a pathway that climatologists just don't understand. I mean, we have no clue, just no clue of what the pathways are. And it's a pathway that, that has to be found in, in the midst of international relations. And I'm not even starting to talk about the cluelessness of my colleagues when it comes to communications or journalism or or carrying a message or, or convincing uh, uh, demographics or, or being an activist. Malia, where do you, you, you mentioned that you're, that you're, that you were going to grad school and um, where were you going grad school again? What was it? Uh, I'm going in the South of Sweden. Lund. In the Hopefully. South, Lund, I'm right, you're going to Lund. And, but what was the subject? It was environmental studies and sustainable science. That's the name of the program. Right, right. So one thing, there's this company in Sweden, I think, and one of the things that it was, a, it was a small startup and they came to, they came to present at AUP at one point, because that's one of the things we had is we had people presenting their environmental uh, projects. And one of the, and it was a startup company. And one of the things they did is they called it um, a moving forest, which is a very sort of pretty name. But in fact, what it is, is, is uh, they, they had these benches that were that were that had a big backdrop covered in moss and what moss is is basically a very very fast moving um uh, a quickly growing and fast moving um uh, uh, foliage that captures you know that basically trees are carbon is a is a low-tech carbon capturing technology it's the best technology we have to extract CO2 from the atmosphere. And so they were producing this and it was a Swedish company. And I can't, I think, I think it was based in Lund. So there's so much, there's so much, you know, new ideas and so much, you know, driving force 
um, people your age. I am, you know, I'm, I'm so glad I, I already knew you. I'm so glad I had this chance to chew the fat with you in front of prospective students, admitted students for AUP. Thank you so much. And I'd like to also thank all people who are participating. We're very grateful that you've chosen, that you're looking at AUP to come here and uh, possibly join this major or any other major. And I'd like to thank also admissions for giving me the chance to talk with you two and to talk in front of our viewers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Claudio. Thank you, Mali and Clark. This is really interesting. Uh, and I hope uh, you at home, you all enjoyed this session. Um, this concludes our AUP virtual week, but you can uh, watch all of the live sessions uh, again um, through the same links on YouTube. So feel free to do that. And if you have any questions following up um, this virtual week, contact your admissions counselor. And if you don't know who your admissions counselor is, or you'd like to be put in touch with one, email um, admissions at aup.edu, and we'll put you in touch with a counselor for your area. So thank you again, um, you three for joining us and uh, participating. And you at home, I wish you a good evening and a good weekend.